Welcome to School Zone, the show all about your local school districts here in the White Mountains. I'm your host, Amy Tregaskis from Sholo. I'm an educator, but mostly a parent. Today we have local school business managers, Greg Schubert from Sholo, Brenda Thomas-Martinez from Blue Ridge, and Mark Ollerton um, from Snowflake. And welcome to the show. Today we are going to be, well, thank you guys for being on the show. Thanks for I really having us. Thank you for having us. Um, today, we wanted to talk about the hot topic of Proposition 123. Proposition 123 passed, and with that, what does that mean to our local schools? So I'd like each of you, if you wouldn't mind, um, take a couple minutes and just tell us um, how the, prop, the passage of Prop 123 will affect your schools at, at your district. Well, in Sholo, with Prop 123, it's, it's adding another $509,000 to our budget. So with that money, we're able to give raises, which we haven't had been able to do in the last seven years. So our employees, you know, once we get our budget approved at the July board meeting, they can look forward to these raises. We're also looking at this money as, you know, monies that we can use towards capital expenditures that we haven't been able to do in the past because the state has cut our budgets back so far. Um, right now, Shello has a budget for capital expenditures of $244,000. It's kind of hard to, to purchase transportation equipment and, you know, maintain your facilities on $244,000. So that's, what's, that's what this money does for the Shello School District. Greg, is that... Um um, is that money that is coming in just one time or is that money that comes now every year? How that's money that that's well one of the things that we're looking at doing is because we one of the, we don't want to do is this is 10-year money so we don't want to price ourselves out of the market for teachers by by giving these huge raises year after year after year and then 10 years down the road we don't have the money to, that we can afford anybody so it's really prudent on us to make sure that we are giving raises that we can afford 10, 11, and 12 years down the road. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, Brenda, how about for your school district, for Blue Ridge? Well, at Blue Ridge, we're getting about $414,000 next year, or, or this year, in Prop 123 monies. How does that money come to each school? Is that per stu is it by a formula for each student that you have? Is that why your money is different than what Cholo's getting? Yes, it's based on student count. Okay. Um, what it's doing is it's actually raising the base level, going from thirty five hundred to about thirty six hundred students, thirty six hundred okay. dollars per student. And the difference is what's coming in the form of Prop One Two Three. Okay. And we're able to calculate how much that's going to be for FY sixteen and then another amount for FY seventeen. And at Blue Ridge we're doing some really unique things. Um, we haven't been able we have been able to give raises every year because we've had declining enrollment for the last eight years or so. Luckily we've had increasing enrollment this year alone. So we're able to add some of the programs that we've lost from previous years. For example, we're able to bring back an automotive program. Nice. We're able to bring back a photography program. And one of the other things that we're doing is we're able to purchase K-8 math curriculum books with Prop 123 monies because, like Greg said, our capital funding has been decreased for the last 10 years. So we haven't been able to afford textbooks and library books. So we're able to at least transfer a portion of that monies into capital to purchase those items. And we're also giving some increases for certified and class classified staff as well. And like Greg said, we're trying not to give increases that we can't sustain 10 years down the road. We're, the board has actually agreed to do a 3% increase plus a 2% signing bonus. That 2% signing bonus goes away next year, so we're not obligated to give that from one year to the next. Okay, thank you. Mark, how about for Snowflake? Snowflake School District in fiscal year 16 will be receiving about $460,000 okay. and then another $160,000 dollars in fiscal year 17. We'll be rolling that money over into the fiscal year 17, so a little over $520,000 or so going into fiscal year 17. What we're using that those funds for? Um, since 2008, the, the state has, has basically put, cut their budgets based on the back of, you know, on the backs of the K-12. A lot of their budget cuts came from there, and we, we've had to cut back in teachers and all kinds of, of classified staff. We're actually expanding. We've had growth in our district. We're adding five new teachers, teaching positions next year. 
fourth grade, kindergarten, two junior high positions. When you add those <coughs> positions, is that like reducing class size? That'll be reducing our class size. Actually managing Wonderful. the growth. We've had some targeted growth areas. Mm -hmm. Our fourth grade is a big classes and uh, our special ed needs continue to go up. So we'll be targeting some of our growth areas, expanding some kindergarten programs that we, we haven't had uh, collectively throughout the district, okay. but just in one of our schools. And then we also got and gave raises, 1.8% uh, to 2% increase for teaching staff. And we addressed our classified staff a little differently. The, the beginning salary of our classified staff, uh, the majority that make less than $10 an hour, uh, their starting salary is about minimum wage. And we created a salary schedule that starts the majority of our, our the, the minimum starting salary for a classified employee at $10 an hour. So if you had a classified employee that has been working at the school, will they would they bump up to that at least? If, if they were making less, less, than, than less than $10, it was bumped up to 10 and, and then nice. the, the rest of the classified staff received about a 4% increase in pay. Wow, that's great. Thank so. you so much. Um, so, when do you guys expect to receive this money? Mark, could you answer that? Oh, we expect to receive it here in June uh, for fiscal year 16. Okay. And it's being paid mainly out of state aid for those who are 100% state aid districts. This will be 100% out of that. What does it mean to be a state aid district? Well, in, in many cases, is that your assessed valuation is, is low enough such that you need help from the state to suppl supplement your cash flow to cover your budget. Meaning that as taxpayers are not paying enough taxes for the amount of money that you need as a school district. It, so equal, it state, equalizes it, yes. Okay, it equalizes so the it. state comes back and backfills so that everyone's getting that amount of money per student. Right. Okay, that's great. Um, so Prop 123, it barely passed, but it didn't have any like really requirements as to where the money goes. And so this is, it's up to the school districts to decide where that money goes, is that correct? Okay, yes, yes, yes. and um, is it the end all? Like meaning like we have all this money that you're getting, but it's like a half a million here, half a million there, just under half a million. Um, isn't Sholo's budget like closer to 12 million? Our next next year's good budget is going to be just over 13 million dollars. Um, the one thing you got to remember, you know, is this money is part of the um, the lawsuit that was settled. What we're getting is we're getting 60 cents on a dollar of what we should have been getting over the last few years that that the state refused to fund the um, the, the inflation the right. inflation factor on on the base support level. So that's that's where this money is coming from. If this money was given us to, to us as it should have been, that money would have been in our M&O budgets, and we could have used that money. We could have taken that money, and we could have put it into capital needs. We could have used it to pay, you know, for textbooks and or fuel for our vehicles, or we could use it for whatever. So for the it, past eight years. For the past eight years. Right. So this is just a small like. A drop in the bucket. So one of the questions I got from community people was, well, now that Prop 123 passed, why do they need more money? Why would a school even need a budget override? Um, Greg, you want to talk about that? Well, one of the reasons why Shola would really like to have to pass an override is, you know, our teachers are some of the best teachers here on the mountain, and. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to appreciate that in the form of raises in the last seven years. And by passing an override, that is something that we can actually do, is we can actually give those raises to teachers without having to worry about Prop 123 money, and, and, and even if the state is going to be able to sustain it, because there were some sections in the law that said that if certain things certain things happen, that the state wouldn't have to pay this money. You know, there's still talks of a couple of lawsuits out there that could put a, a kibosh on the entire thing. So, it's it's not right now. It's not guaranteed money. Okay, so the Prop 123 is not guaranteed money. Not really. Okay. I know that there's people that have already filed lawsuits. Um, so Blue Ridge has already passed an override. So um, 
why Prop 123? What does your override do for you that Prop 123 like wouldn't necessarily even take into a consideration? Well, luckily our bo our voters have been very supportive in the Blue Ridge School District, and we actually passed a 15% override two years ago. So we're actually in our second year. And what was that for? And that provides about 1.5 million dollars to our MNO budget alone. And when we went out to the voters and talked about the MNO override and what was what it was going to provide, it's going to provide us to to pay for all day kindergarten, which we don't get funding from the state for anymore because we really do believe that bringing kindergartners in at the primary levels will stay with the with the district the entire 12 years. So that was one of the reasons why they, the board members wanted to do that. Um, and then the other thing too is to main our, maintain our technology program. You know, with the changing times, we need more and more technology for the students. So we wanted to beef up our program and we're moving in that direction slowly. Um, and then some of the other things the board members wanted to do was provide increases for the staff. Because like Greg said, it's getting harder and harder to provide raises for our staff members. I think we're all part of an insurance consor consortium where we see double digit increases every year. Mm -hmm. And it's getting harder and harder to take a slice of the pie that we have and use it towards salary increases when a large chunk of it is going to benefits. So that provided us some relief as far as providing increases for our staff as well. When you say MNO, can you say what that, um, what MNO stands for and sure. what that, that means? Sure, m and is maintenance and operation, okay. and that basically pays for all of our operating costs, day-to-day -day operating costs, salaries and benefits and professional services and supplies, okay. utilities, um, liability insurance, that pays what for all of those. What would not be in an m and budget? That would be on the capital side, that's library books and textbooks and furniture and equipment, computer equipment, things like okay. that. Things that are going to stay around longer, Of a tangible right? nature, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mark, what about you? Um, with with Snowflake, they haven't been on an override. I think we were talking earlier for 30 years right. since they've been on an override. And so um, tell me again about the cuts for capital. Okay. In, uh, early in probably 2008, 2009, the state legislature said that they needed to cut state aid. Which is, a, which is a savings to their budget of 85.5% of the state aid was cut, which means to, well, for capital purposes or district additional assistance, which is capital funding. And for us, we're Snowflake School District, that's $960,000 in fiscal year 16. Almost a million dollars. Almost a million dollars. In one year. Right. And our budget is, our capital budget is $136,000. So when, when Greg said our budget's what, 235 for, for this 244, year? 244, yeah. The, that's that's money that, that is desperately needed. Mm -hmm. That nine hundred sixty thousand dollars. We haven't bought textbooks in our school district ten, twelve years. Okay, we, right. these these monies are now all in competition with each other. I have eighteen thousand square feet of facilities that we have to maintain. We have acres and, no and acres of, of grass to and you know, mm -hmm. grounds to keep. That now, the funds that were set aside to man manage that is in competition with, direct competition with education. Is that the same funds for buses? Yes. For, so for the cost of one bus, you can think of it like that, the cost of one bus, mm -hmm. you have to do all this education. And then, the, then there's the, I want to say it's a mandate, but we're going to go to testing, all of our testing for students is now going to be on a computer. Well, you gotta where's the money to do the infrastructure? Where's right. the money? To, those, those are concerns that we have. So Proposition 123, although it gave us a $100,000 to Snowflake Schools, that's, that's one-tenth of a, of a cut that over 10 years they're going to make up one year of cuts. You know, and so it, appreciated, yes, and that right. money will definitely go into the classroom and it will go to where it can, can do the most good. But, but these cuts were, they just decimated us. Uh, amazing though, and you can go to the Auditor General website, and you can, you can look at all the school reports on the Auditor General website, the classroom dollar reports, and you can see how the, the White Mountain schools are performing amongst their peers, amongst the state. Incredible. You so gotta admit, they do a great job. Your schools are doing amazing with the least amount of money. It's it, very impressive, and I know it's partly, I mean, it's 
due to our great teachers, and but it's partly due to you guys that manage our funds for us also. So and, thank you. And to tie up this whole thing in, mm -hmm. a, in a nice bow, I would hope, and that is the reason why I think overrides have a place, a very important place, is we can continue to expand programs. We can continue to um, work on having high scores and, and programs that would give a proper education to kids our sporting activities, all these programs that are being cut or parents are having to pay for 100% now. That's a, that's a common theme you see in a lot of school districts. But we, we don't do that. We, you know, we offer these programs that, even though there's a participation fee, they, they can minimal. still perform. Yeah, it's minimal. It really provides a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, one of the things that I have loved is that each of your schools really does put, like, they they make a priority on the kids and what the students, um, the activities to bring them in to, because it's one thing to just do academics, but when you've got something over here that maybe is a hobby or an activity or music or sports or something, that gives them more of a reason to come and do well in school. So I know that that is, that's an important thing. It's important to be well-rounded as a student. And I think that our schools up here do a great job of trying to provide all of that for our kids. Um, Greg, is there anything else you'd like us to know about school finance as it relates to Sholo? Well, I, I just kind of wanted to, to talk about one of the things that Mark was just talking about with the, uh, with the capital funding. You know, the, the capital cuts to funding for Sholo schools is right at $1.2 million. The cuts? That's the cut. You know, so I am missing $1.2 million. And we have really struggled this year trying to make sure that, you know, our capital money was spent in the right places. Uh, we held on to it. We weren't buying new furniture. We weren't buying anything. And then it gets time to around testing time and we drop a hundred thousand dollars on laptops and carts and that's just a scratch at the at the technology that these kids are going to need to be able to take these tests in the future it's interesting to me that like technology my kids grew up with internet so that's not technology to them that's commonplace but in our schools our schools have been here longer than my kids and that's not something that you just have. Every kid doesn't have a computer in their school. And to be able to just take their state test, they have to have a computer individually to be testing yeah. on. That's a huge expense, so I understand that. Anything else? Um, no, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Brenda, what about you? Is there anything else that you'd like to share or would like our communities to know about school finance? Well, I agree with, with Mark and, and Greg in regards to capital because over 10 years, we have 10 years of deferred maintenance in, on our facilities. And we've had to go every year to the school facilities board to either get grants or you know little pieces of, of monies to try to maintain our facilities. And that's not enough. And that's over, over $10 million for the district. I mean, $10 million of capital monies that we could have used to buy equipment to maintain our facilities, mm -hmm. to do library books and, and textbooks and things like that. And it's been really difficult for Blue Ridge to operate on that because the board has been really good about trying to look into the future and trying to expand how they want to spend their capital money. And with the little capital monies that we've had, they've allowed us to go out for capital leases, five-year leases in minimal payments to try to buy new buses. Because a bus is about $150,000 just but for one bus. But if you can't get your kids to school, You've got to have you've exactly. got to have those buses, and you don't want them breaking down. Exactly, and yeah. then you have you know computer technology infrastructure that we've had to go out for a lease for. So the board has done has looked at the the capital and and how little we get, and tried to you know plan it out five years in advance, saying okay, we need to go out for a 1.1 million dollar technology infrastructure lease because we know what's coming down the line. Mm -hmm. So we've barely had enough money to make those lease payments, and that's one of the things that we've communicated to the legislatures is that we're just not getting enough capital monies and you know it, it, it seems like it, it they turn a deaf ear on us because they don't listen um, and that's one of the things that I think we all need to communicate is that we have the same needs in, the, in rural Arizona that we do down in the valley.
Valley. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we need to have great technology infrastructure. We need to have good internet service. Mm -hmm. And you know, we struggle because we don't have the competition that they have down in the Valley. Right, that's true. Yeah. Thank you. Mark? Well, I think two things. Uh, one is, is we want to operate these, these schools in an efficient, effective manner. Mm -hmm. And efficient meaning at the, at the lowest cost, best cost possible. Let that dollar stretch as far as we can. And, and we want to be effective in the sense that kids, kids get educated and have a positive, safe environment to, to right. be educated. And I think we really do a good job. And that's in the mind of, all, at least I know of, I'm sure in all of the administrators, that's in foremost in their mind and the board members. The other thing is that <clears throat> I believe that we have an integrity to our taxpayers. And, and we owe it to them. And I believe that with that integrity is important to, to all of us. We want we want the taxpayers to know, because we are, we are taxpayers, that, that we safeguard their money, we safeguard their trust, and we want to be able to do our jobs and do the job of educating children in a manner that why they can walk in our, our doors and, and know that it's being done in, in a way that, that's pleasing to them, that they understand. And they can feel confident that they know yes, that definitely. their child is going to get a good education no matter which school they attend in the whole state. Like, really? Um, so my last question is, it, as a community member, what can we do? What could we do to help? Greg? I, I think the biggest thing is, is the community involvement with getting in touch with their legislators and telling them where they're displeased. You know, telling them, you know, we are not happy with the way that you have balanced the state's budget on the back of K-12 education. Uh, we are not happy with the fact that, you know, over the last few years, you know, prisons are getting increases in money, but yet K-12 education keeps getting cut. You know, I, I, not a statistician or anything, but I'm pretty sure there's some sort of a correlation there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's the community talking with their legislators and telling them exactly what it is that they want for K-12 education. Brenda, same I thing. agree. I, I agree with Greg because I think it's important to talk to the legislators, let them know what's going on, let them know what's going on in your community, communicate to them, talk to us. We're available all the time just so they can kind of get a feedback on, on what's going on in the state and we, we're more than willing to share that information with them. So as a community member, we could come to you guys and say, what's going on? Definitely. Absolutely. And then go voice our opinion with our state legislature. Exactly. Mark? Well, first of all, I think we're grateful for all the support that we can and do get from our mm -hmm. community members, from coming out to our events, supporting uh, extracurricular activities, being involved in the classrooms. Those are the types of support that, that we we welcome. If there's if being involved as you know, wanting to become a board member, uh, wanting to be serving on parent committees, mm -hmm. uh, feel free to give ideas. Uh, this is a public education and. Parents need to be welcomed into doing this type of work and being a part of it. So, I, I've listened to my superintendent on a couple of not a couple of occasions, more than that. But <laughs> on one occasion, he said specifically about our legislators. He said, we, "We're our own worst enemies. We 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 vote in who represents us, and if we have difficulty, then." We really need to be reaching out to them, talking to them, letting them know that we see these concerns happening in our yeah. area and make a difference that way as well. When I first started going to school board meetings, and I've been going since my daughter was in kindergarten and she just graduated, um, one of the board members, Dave Tenney, said to, to me, and really I was the only one there attending that wasn't part of the school, um, he said that schools are run by those who show up. And I think that that, um, as community members, that's what we can do. We can show up, we can be part, we can be vocal, we can come in and talk if we've got questions, we can ask. We can participate in committees, like you said. We can um, do all those things to get involved and let our legislatures know as well. But I believe that education is one of those things that is run by those who show up. So I really appreciate you guys for coming. Thank you so much. I really, Thank you. it's Thanks been for great. Us, um, I hope I can talk you into coming another time. So um, thanks for joining us here on School Zone, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.